Number two. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. Number two.
so nice to be singing with all of you today again. <laughs> Number seven, number 107 is what it's supposed to be. 107, the love of God. Since the love of God is shed, priceless blessings on my head, I have Thank you. 
333. Never grow old. 833.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and good name. Father, we thank you for another day, another beautiful, glorious day, a first day that we can meet to worship you, sing songs of praise. Father, we thank you for such a beautiful place to live. To, to people that have never been here, that they, they just don't know. They just don't know what, what a beautiful place we have. Father, we have many sick folks among our number that really, really need your help. They need your strength and your assurance. Father, we ask your blessings for Martha Lewis. She's having a terrible time. And I miss her very much. Father, I ask your blessings for Steve, and Kat, and John, their family, their loss. don't know what to say except we're sorry. Father, we thank you for your word that's been given us. We thank you for lessons taught. We thank you for people who have obeyed the gospel lately. We thank you for this effort that we make to put it out for each and every one that'll tune in to hear, whether they're right here in the building or not. It's, 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 a, it's a blessing that we can do this. Father, we pray for our country. I don't know what to pray for except peace, understanding that comes from you. I ask you to help us settle our country. Father, we ask that you go with us when we leave this place. Protect us, guide us, keep us humble. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. John 3, 16, 16, 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son.
Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. The 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, starting in 23, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul continues, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father in heaven, as we come before you to, to, to take this bread and this fruit of the vine, we do remember you, Lord. We acknowledge you in, in all that we do. We pray, Lord, that we walk in the ways that you would guide us, guide us to go. Be with us, Lord, and, and let us do this in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The, uh, there is a contribution box at the back of the building for you to, to um, drop in your contribution. And, and are we still accepting mail-ins, or are you still here on Saturday afternoon, John? Okay. So there are several ways that we can lay by in store, as Paul tells the Corinthians later on in the, in the later chapters of 1 Corinthians. Jesus, hold my hands. Two hundred seventy-two.
encouragement of 863. 863. Oh, like last Sunday, it sure is nice to hear that response back. We welcome all of you here. We welcome all of you who are tuning in. I don't know if you check out the Facebook site, but as of this morning, last Lord's Day's worship had had 1,816 views. That is tremendous. That is tremendous. And hopefully more and more people will find out about our services and begin to tune in. But we're glad you're with us today. Now, as Christians, we've probably been looking around at our world recently and thinking, what is wrong? What is the matter? Why are things the way they are throughout the world? Wars in places. Hatred in others. The world is really a messed up place. Now, I could end this sermon with one passage of Scripture. And I know all of you would holler amen and be happy. But let, let's at least go to the one passage of Scripture first. Because this summarizes it all. It's 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. It draws a contrast. It says, we know we are of God. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So that explains it. That's why the world is messed up. That's why there are so many problems out there. Now we tend to turn around and summarize this verse with one word, sin. So let's think about that a few moments. Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it's a universal problem. A universal problem. Everyone is going to be confronted with it. Everyone is going to deal with it. And all accountable people, sadly, are going to be entrapped by it. Now, literally, the word sin means to miss the mark. Like somebody shooting at a target and they totally miss it. But the scriptures tell us a lot of things about sin. And that helps us better see why the world is in the condition it is in. For example, Isaiah 59 in verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Now though Adam and Eve did not die just like that, when they committed sin, this happened. As soon as they disobeyed the will of God, they were separated from him. They had moved away. God hadn't gone anywhere. Adam and Eve moved. And when we sin, we move away from God. Luke 15 illustrates this so beautifully. The prodigal son took his inheritance, left his father, and went and wasted his life. And that's exactly what we do in sin. We leave our heavenly father and we go start wasting life. Life's precious. We're taking a gift of God and we're just wasting it as long as we are separated from the Father. But that's not all sin does. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. 
lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, every time I read this passage, I think of Pharaoh. His heart was hardened. His heart got harder and harder and harder. What a stubborn individual he really was. And what a calamity he brought down on a whole nation of people. Well, let's think about it. When we allow ourselves to become hardened to sin, quite honestly, it becomes easy to sin. Our consciences are not pricked anymore. You know, I've talked to people who have been burned seriously. And where they've been burned, they don't always have feeling there anymore. They don't feel anything. Well, in a very similar way, that's what sin does to our heart. It sears that heart over. And we don't have any feelings of consciousness regarding sin. When we do bad, we don't feel bad about it. Read the book of Jeremiah and see how he describes the people of God there. But let's read on about these consequences. 2 Timothy 2.26 and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. People in sin are Satan's captives. And quite honestly, they're doing hard labor because Satan's not a good master. And so people are his captives. They've been caught in a snare, in a trap, and they can't get out. Now, a lot of people in the world would not admit that Satan's their master, that Satan's their ruler. But if they are living in sin, that is the simple fact. You belong to the devil. You're his. To do his will and to follow his bidding. But let's think again. Psalms 38 and verse 4. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Sin weighs people down. Even hardened people sometimes have guilt. I still think about that Russian captain that we met on one of the trips to Russia, and how when he finally spoke up, he didn't even speak of sin in the plural. He said, I have too many sins. He knew where his life was. He knew what he had done to himself. He knew the fix he was in, and sadly, at that moment, he felt helpless. Well, when people are burdened down with sin, they really do feel helpless. How do I do something about this? How do I get rid of this? How do I take this weight away from me? But then we go to Psalm 69, verse 5. Here's another sobering thought about sin. Oh God, you know my foolishness. And my sins are not hidden from you. Now sadly, a lot of individuals who have been taken in the snare of the devil have the idea, well, God really doesn't see, God really doesn't know, God really doesn't care, and they could not be further from the truth. God does see. God does know. God does care. Go to Psalms 139. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. If I were to ascend into the heavens, you were there. Well, probably a lot of you don't remember this. But when John Glenn was shot into orbit, God speed John Glenn. And when he got in orbit, his comment was to answer Yuri Gagarin, the Soviet, Cosmonaut, I see God everywhere. 
By the way, when SpaceX launched a couple of weeks ago, twice they bl blessed them with the phrase, Godspeed. Yeah, God sees, God knows. We can't hide it from him. And so he is fully aware of sin when it is in our lives. So what's the ultimate climax of this? Romans 3, 6, 23, I'm sorry. The wage of sin is death. Not physical death here. Eternal separation from God forever. That's the condition of the world. Now, let me say a couple of things here. Number one, we shouldn't be happy about that. Uh-uh, not at all. God's not happy about it. God's not happy that there are lost people. And that's the word we use, lost. Back to Luke 15. There are four lost things brought out to us in that chapter. A lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost younger brother, yes, a lost older brother. Four lost things. And there's an interesting thought. For the lost sheep, there was searching. For the lost coin, there was searching. For the lost boy, there was longing and waiting and running too. For the lost older brother that was begging to be what you should be, lost. So God's not happy about it. So what did he do? God sent one remedy for lostness. Jesus summarized his whole mission on earth in one passage of scripture. He said in Luke 19.10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now if they come up with a, some kind of cure for this C-19, you can better believe people are going to line up. They're going to want it. And give me a dose of that stuff so I can get over this or never have to face this again. Okay, we've got something that makes C-19 look like a Sunday afternoon picnic. And I'm not minimizing the horrific effects that this virus can have upon human beings because it is awful. But the effects of sin are worse. The longest the virus can last is to the end of our life. It may take our life, but that's as long as it can last. But the effects of sin last forever. And so Jesus came to do something about it. Now I said one way. Why do I say that? Peter said in Acts 4 and verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Moses? Uh -uh. Muhammad? Mm -mm. Buddha? Mm -mm. Gautama? Not Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can do anything about sin. So what did he come to do? I love 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. This is a great passage. If you don't have it marked, mark it. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You remember earlier we said Satan had us in his snare? He had us in his little trap. Jesus came to destroy that thing. He came to break the bars of the prison, if you will. 
You know, maybe Peter being let out of jail that night before he was supposed to be executed by the angel has a little greater depth of meaning than Peter was simply let out of jail the night before he was supposed to face death. Maybe there's a little symbolism there that that's what God does for all of us. He opens that prison through Jesus Christ. Jesus has the key. John tells us in the book of Revelation, when he unlocks, he unlocks and nobody can lock back. But sadly, when he locks, it is locked and no one can unlock it. But he came to destroy the works of the devil. Okay. He put it another way in John 10, in verse 10. Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Those people out in sin right now, those people separated from God, there's a term the New Testament uses for that time after time. It's called death. They're separated. Jesus came to bring life. He came to bring us back to God. He came to build a relationship between us and God. And it's an abundant relationship. Let me tell you, a relationship with Satan's one-sided. You're going to lose every single time, period. There's no victory in that. A relationship with God benefits us. We get rid of that weight of sin, number one, but we're in fellowship with the one who is life, the one who gave Life, and the one that wants us to have eternal life. So again, people might pause and ask, well, how do we get that? First John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. So here we go. Everything you read in the New Testament when it talks about relationship with God, when it talks about forgiveness of sins, when it talks about getting out of this awful mess that we have put ourselves in, it always comes back to Jesus. Do you have him? Or, let's think of that another way. Does he have you. Now somebody has you today. Let me assure you of that. Either Satan has you or Jesus has you. Now, I don't know about you, I'm going to choose Jesus. You know, that's kind of what Joshua told the people. He'd been with them, leading them in the conquest of Canaan. He'd been Moses' assistant for years. And as he is finally about to step down and retire... He gives them a challenge. You choose today who you're going to serve. Okay, I'm not Joshua. But let me throw out a challenge. You choose today who you're going to serve. Are you going to continue to serve Satan if you're in sin? Or are you going to be wise enough to turn and serve Christ? If you're in Christ right now, are you going to be wise enough to stay in that relationship and keep serving Christ and never, never, never give up and go back and start serving the devil again? You lose every time when you serve the devil. So maybe that's why Jesus said then in John 14, 6, I am the way the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Sin takes us away from the Father. Jesus.
brings us back to the Father. What's going to cure the problems in the world? One thing. One. It's a one thing solution. It's just convincing the world that that's what they've got to have. And that one thing solution is for people to become new creations in Jesus Christ. That's the only fix. That's the only help. So today, if you're a part of the world, if you're one of those people who is really messed up, let me call you to the solution. Believe on Jesus with all of your heart. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him and wash away those sins in the waters of baptism. Get rid of your sin. Get in the relationship with Jesus Christ and with the Father and with God's people and start a walk toward heaven. You know, John talked about singing today, and boy, it was good. Have you ever thought about what that first song is going to be like when we get to heaven? It's going to be one of those <gasps> moments. I mean, it's going to stagger us to hear all the redeemed at one time lift their voices in praise to God. Wow, I want to be there. I really do. I want to be a part of that. I may not finish the song, but I sure want to be a part of starting with it, at least. But you can only do that through Jesus. So if you need to become a Christian, do so today. If you're here and you need the prayers of the church, let me encourage you to come. And again, if you're listening to this and you're not a Christian, Seek a gospel preacher out to help guide you and lead you to obedience in Christ. And if you do need to respond right now, won't you please come as we stand together and sing. What thou do in Jesus, the question comes to you, and you sure is good to stand in front of all of you again and have opportunity to be together this morning. We're very, very thankful for this opportunity. Brother Billy 
said that he was not Joshua. And he'll probably agree with me if I say he, he ain't Solomon either. <laughs> but he did, he did, he is as wise as Solomon when he uses Solomon's words in our bulletin this morning. If you haven't read what he wrote, I think you need to. Uh, because this is really, really a critical point in our nation's history right now about how dangerous words are. And the last verse he had was, A soft answer turneth away wrath, and I think we can all take that to heart about how we deal with our, our online conversations, with our one-on-one -on -one conversations as we begin to open those up again. Uh, but very good, Brother Billy. I just wanted to compliment you there. That was, that was wise of you to talk about that. Uh, in our announcements, if you don't have a bulletin, there is an online version. Uh, and you can receive that via text, uh, just a, a message or a phone call to Scott Hawkins, and he can uh, get those to you, a digital version of this. Uh, I will read for the benefit of those who are at home and not here today to hold a, a bulletin in their hands, what, what is uh, contained in this for today. Obviously, our, our prayers go to Steve and Sandra and the passing of their mother, uh, Lucille Rawson, on Friday. Please continue uh, your prayers for them and that family. It seems like a lot's been going on there, Brother Steve. We, we definitely feel for you and your loss. Uh, a positive note, Judy Blevins, the surgery was well, and she's recovering at home, but she's asked for us to keep her in our prayers. An amazing uh, uh, notice here, Nancy Swearinger's niece, uh, Jadette Carman, reports that the vision in her eye has returned after having had no vision in the eye since the surgery to re remove a tumor. She attributes this solely to prayers and to God's healing hands. So please continue your prayers for her for she is still in a very serious condition. Uh, ladies, there will be a bridal shower for Hannah Hutchison. This says bride elect of Andrew Hutchison, but I think he's a groom elect of Hannah. On July 19th, this will be at 4 p.m. in the multipurpose room. Uh, and then there is a notice of a uh, virtual VBS, and it will be the Rocky Railway VBS, and this is uh, from Amanda Hawkins Whithouse, who would like to invite all of our children to join with the Mayfair congregation in a virtual VBS, uh, which will begin the, uh, Wednesdays, each Wednesday morning uh, through the month of July. Are there any other announcements that are, did not make the bulletin this week?
bow with me, please. Father, we're most thankful for your Son, through which we have so many things. One of the greatest that we're always thankful for, Father, is that peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, in these times, in these days, that peace is the thing, Father, that gets us through, that allows us to want to do good, to share your light, to reach out to help others, Father, because that's how and why you created us. Father, we thank you when you loan to us your strength, your endurance, your courage, so that we can do the things daily, Father, that's necessary, whether it be not just in our lives, Father, but our jobs, the things that we volunteer our time through to help others. We're so thankful for all these things, Father, because we know that we're giving so much of ourselves, Father, to serve you, that there's no time to look at ourselves, to feel bad, to feel lowly, to lose all those things, Father, that you've blessed us with because of our moments of sin and doubt and forgetfulness of what we have and what we are so much in you every day, Father. Thank you for a blessing of a church family, the blessing of a wonderful place to come and worship you and praise you in song. We thank you for that every day. As we go, Father, just be with those who are sick. Bless those who are out helping others to remain healthy and send your angels, Father, be with those daily who stand beside those who pass away from this COVID-19 and the other illnesses we face in this flesh. We thank you, Father, for our soldiers, our policemen, our first responders. Please bless and be with us all and just never let us forget, Father, that we shouldn't judge the many by the one. Let's pray we'll have many more times and opportunities to share that with the world, Father, so they're no longer blind. We thank you and just ask all these things, Father, in your Son's holy name. Amen.